meteorologist, uh, climatologist, uh, class 2006 from University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And uh, I currently work as a brewer, making the best beer in the state of Nebraska. But in my free time, I like to chase storms, I like to forecast, and the last few years, I've been pretty darn good at forecasting these here tropical cyclones. So let's take a look at what's going on and what's going on for the next few weeks and the rest of the season, shall we? Gosh, I have so many tabs, I uh, I don't even know where to start. But let's start with what's happening right now. Uh, we've got ourselves a potential tropical cyclone 2, which is going to be tropical depression 4, uh, at least according to uh, the Regional and Mesoscale Meteorology Branch, RAMB. Um, it is already tropical depression 4. That's what's come across on my feed. So I'm guessing that's what we'll have here. Uh, it's currently, they have it at 30 knots, which sounds about right. Uh, looking at the multi-platform analysis, we're at about 30 knots. Uh, if I go jump over here, look at the experimental stuff, uh, we can see. Where, where is it? And where my Dvorak is? There it is. Uh, we can see a Dvorak here. Uh, we've got Dvorak numbers probably hanging out around 4 or 4.5 right now. That would be indicative of a borderline tropical depression, tropical storm. Um, kinetic energy analysis shows that's the same. It's pretty pretty low-end system right now. But it is forecast to intensify fairly rapidly. Uh, NHC has been fairly conservative so far. Uh, I think its path is good. It, their path is similar to what the models have right now. So if I go back over to our friend at uh, Tropical Tidbits, uh, we've got potential TD4. Uh, we look at global models, ensemble models, all of the models. Basically, we're taking this into northern Mexico, about 50, 75 miles south of Brownsville. Um, there is some potential we could get some impacts in the southern U.S. and Brownsville for landfall, but the bigger concern is going to be rain, since the majority of the rainfall will be on the uh, eastern side or on the eastern side of the storm. Um, ignore intensity guidance at this point. Uh, models have not been handling this well. Pretty much every model has absolutely fake, just had no idea what to do with the storm, other than ships and the rapid intensity rapid intensity models. So back to here we go. Um, let's look at storm synopsis here. Uh, we can see the TD4 has some really intense microwave uh, signature right now. This is means we've got some really, really hot towers going on the last few hours. It has weakened a little bit, at least on IR presence. You can see here there's a, a circulation here. Uh, just passing out of the Bay of Campeche. It's on the western side of the CDO. Um, it's kind of, you know, phasing out because we are currently in the diurnal minimum. Uh, nocturnal maximum will start as soon as the sun goes down and will continue until about 6 to 8 a.m. Uh, we have pretty good towers, and we still have some towers going on. So this thing is not absolutely not really dead. Um, this is just a pulse. Uh, as you can see by this uh, fan we have going on here, we've got a really nice cloud fan going on. There's great upper-level divergence here. We can see support for that if we look at meso analysis. So I'm going to go over to the uh, Wisconsin site here, University of Wisconsin site, uh, and we're going to go ahead and check out a couple things. First off, I want to look at Mimic, which is the total precipitable water content, and you can see very clearly that there is a sudden ball of pink that forms in the in the Bay of Campeche in Southern Gulf. That is a dead giveaway of pretty much imminent tropical development when you have a situation like this. Let's go ahead and get ourselves a pop up here. Uh, again, our infrared still looks pretty good. Um, you've got good hot towers on the east side. Let's look at some more, some more stuff here. Sea surface temps are like bath water. Um, we're, to, we're talking 30 C, so that's basically like, what, 80, 85, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, some areas are actually up to 90, 90 degrees. 
along the coast on the north side. Um, it's This is an extraordinarily hot gulf right now. Uh, there's our total precipitable water. Um, very, very moist. There's not a much drier to deal with. It's it's still far, far inland, so it's not fighting any drier and will not fight any drier until it starts to hit the mountains. Um, there is a coastal plain here, both in Texas and in Mexico, so the storm potentially could survive for a few hours and continue intensifying as it makes landfall before the mountains start to interfere. Um, that's not a great scenario because an intensifying storm ramming into a bunch of mountains is what creates a heck of a lot of rainfall. Mexico has had an extraordinary amount of rain over the last few weeks. It does not need more. It is going to get a whole lot more. Texas could absolutely use the rain. However, quantitative models are putting out anywhere from 8 to 10 to like 15 inches of rain possible across Texas. So I, I'm not sure how much of that is actually going to happen, but it would not surprise me to see some upper single digit to low double digit results. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a pop-out window, darn it. I blame Wisconsin. It only wants to use... See, this is the best tab that I have, and I have to switch over streams now, don't I? Let's see if I can force it to. All right, well, the heck with the Wisconsin site. It does not want to stream because it uses a silly pop-out. All right, I will use something else instead. Let's look at images and movies. No, not that one. There, can you see that? Excellent. Okay, so this is not as good as the Papa one. The Papa one is much better. You'll just have to trust me when I say that it's like bathwater out there. Um, you can see that the storm is right about here. It is moving the area, moving away from the area of shear that was to the east and moving into an area of lower shear uh, on the, on the, uh, towards Mexico. Uh, shear tendency, shear tendency has been negative, so it's basically moving into even better conditions. Uh, for vorticity, we want to look at the 500 millibore vorticity as where the spin of the system is. Notice that crazy vortex that just went through Iowa, Nebraska, putting down all those random stacks. Uh, you can see that there is some vorticity with the system here. We want to look at divergence and convergence. So we want to look at upper level divergence. So that is high pressure aloft. High pressure aloft is that fan that we saw. It's good, but not super strong. Low level convergence. So we want to see convergence here. There's not much in the way of convergence at the surface. The storm has been having trouble finding a center. Uh, it may have had multiple centers. It just has a very broad center. So that is one of the things that it has been struggling with. But gyre storms like this that form within the gyre or waves that move up through central america infamously have trouble finding centers all right let's get rid of wisconsin they're throwing me off so back to tropical tidbits uh we're looking at a center here roughly in the in the just passing out of the bay of campeche now um as for the actual forecast path Looking at the uh, looking at the different models, both GFS and WARF, and everybody has it basically just south of the Texas-Mexico border uh, in approximately 24 hours. So that's how much time we have to work for. This is about 24 hours, guys. Uh, satellite picture looks good. I'm going to pass over to Dvorak just because Dvorak is awesome. And you can see that we've got high-end Dvorak towers here. Uh, that are pretty good. However, the CDO is eroding pretty quickly. We'll see what happens tomorrow if this can actually get a center together. Uh, NHC has this as 80 and 80. So 80 and 80 is pretty darn high. They expect it to develop. Uh, the current forecast that they have is where is it? At? Here we are, discussion. The current forecast they have is uh, to hit 45. Well, it's currently at 35, approximately. We'll see how strong it gets. They say 45 and then inland. Let's look at the model, shall we, folks? So I'm going to go back to RAMP here because it has a ton of valuable stuff to look at. Remember we mentioned that models have an absolute garbage. 
And models say it's going to make it up to 40 to 45 knots. But models have been garbage. Except for our good friends. Uh, let's see if we can find our Ripa. Ah, the joys of trying to get things to work. So every time that the National Hurricane Center updates something from an invest to a potential cyclone to a tropical depression, it resets all the models and everything has to start over. And so you end up with a bunch of pages all stacking on top of each other and it gets really, really hard to find stuff. So here is our last RIPA model, which was pretty spooky. Now, big black screen, but I'll highlight this for you guys here. So I've been looking at RIPA intensities since about 2017 was when they really started becoming easy to use. And there was 2017 was a really active year, and it became really useful to look at these. So, for for as a rule of thumb, um, you might say, well, Royce, 35 percent is only a one in three chance. That's not that high. Well, the thing is, paying attention to Ripa for the last five years, um, 20 percent, a one in five chance, actually seems more like about a 50 percent chance. And numbers like 25 and 30 percent. Um, those are those are flashing red flags. In fact, the old uh, Wisconsin site that used to have a RIPA analysis page on it, anytime anything was over 35% or 30%, it would be bright red. And that was the highest level of possibility because basically it's impossible to get these things to go much above 30%. So what you're saying is it's only 30%, but it's probably over 50%. The odds of it actually happening in, in real-time analysis, not their statistical analysis, but in actually how it plays out in reality, is that this storm probably has a 50% chance of intensifying 45 knots within the next 36 hours. Um, and this was taken at, uh, this was 18Z. So this is going to be basically down to 45 knots uh, from, well, it's tw from 25. We're already up to 35 knots. So it's already got 10 of that taken care of. It can, if it can get 35 more knots and get up to 60, it will have fulfilled its destiny. So essentially what that means is, is that uh, Ripa is saying probably 60 to 65 knots is our top end, and it looks like it's got a pretty good possibility. Uh, there are a bunch of other stuff. They recently updated their website quite a bit. Uh, and split everything out. It used to be everything was on one page. But I really like the RAM website. You get all of your good satellite pages here. It's got model data, including a uh, kind of a, a blob of ensemble tracks to see where everything is being forecast at by, what's, uh, by what uh, model. This is a pretty cool... This is a pretty cool little app that they have right here. This is neat to see roughly where the, the code of uncertainty of sorts is for the model. Um, I haven't messed much with the wind speed probabilities yet. They probably won't even activate until it's a storm. But the experimental is where the really good stuff is. You can see the aircraft-based tropical cyclone analysis. So basically, whenever they do a flyover, or whenever they have ships or any sort of other inputs, it'll get put into a processor and it'll make sort of a a uh, a simulation of what the cyclone looks like from a, from above. Ah, uh, there we go. The Dvorak looks pretty. That, that, that's a much better looking Dvorak. You can see the uh, diurnal, the nocturnal maximums and the diurnal minimums and the cycle continuing. Um, I don't know why it's thought that there was an I yesterday and today, but apparently it thought that there was an I. And then you can see the really impressive skyrocketing of these probabilities for rapid intensification. Again, they're not through the roof. They're not like... 60-65% readings, but they are still quite high. So, there is what's going on right now. As for my own personal forecast, um, I would say this is probably in the high tropical cyclone category somewhere landing just south of the Texas-Mexico border. Um, whoop, yep, there we go. So, uh, again, there's this bay here just south of the Texas-Mexico border. That's where I'm expecting landfall to be. Um, the storm could potentially stall out over the mountains over a couple of days. Uh, I think heavy rainfall is, our, of course, our main risk here. It's probably the only main risk. I don't think heavy winds will be much of a threat or surge. 
but um, extremely heavy rainfall uh, that could potentially be drought breaking in Texas at least that would be nice. But uh, again, there's always that that uh, double sided blade of getting potentially ten plus inches of rain when you only need five or six. So enough about the silly little spin up in the Gulf. What's going on out there in the rest of the Atlantic? So one thing I want to talk about is the Climate Prediction Center, which has an awesome website. They have this absolutely wonderful graphic for global tropics hazards, which will show you where the potential tropical threats are coming up the next couple of weeks. Notice they've got a big, <laughs> they've got a big flood watch basically over the entire southern United States. That's awesome. But then they have more more flooding in the southwestern U.S. And then this big red zone here, moderate competence of a tropical cyclone coming off of the African continent uh, between the 24th and 30th. Cool. Next week. Awesome. Sounds about right. Let's see what the model uh, Before I get too crazy into other models, let's look at La Nina. Let's look at MJO. So here is our good friend, El Nino La Nina. And where is my 3.4? So what we want to look for specifically is this thing called El Nino 3.4, which is halfway between the El Nino 3 and 4 regions. Those are regions of water in the Pacific where El Nino is happening. Or in this case, it's actually La Nina. So right now we're almost at a La Nina 1. We dove very rapidly all the way back to what is a moderate La Nina. Moderate La Nina is really, really good for tropical systems, typically. Not always, but typically. And for the rest of the season, that is expected to continue all the way through November into December before maybe we get a rebound next year. I don't know. They forecasted the same rebound last year, and it did not happen. Go figure. So let's look at some other stuff here. Let's look at some goodies. So other important stuff, Matt and Julian Oscillation, the MJO. Pretty important stuff here. Let's take a look at that. What do I want to look at? Here we go. So let's, I'm just going to look at the GFS Ensemble here. So this is the GFS Ensemble forecast. So basically, here's some, 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 uh, some information smashed down and it's a, as little as I can say. When the MJO phase is in seven and eight, that is when the best probability of intensification for tropical cyclones and for tornadoes, oddly enough, in the central plains um, is, is going to happen because you have an increase in vorticity passing over the atmosphere at that time at the higher levels. And that increase in vorticity isn't just affected aloft. It also travels down to the surface if there is convection. So seven and eight is where you tend to have formation. And then once storms have formed, it continues to go around in a circle over time. This wave will go around the whole planet, and it just circles about once a month, roughly. It has varying uh, magnitudes and get really big. Sometimes it's kind of small. Sometimes it kind of wanders around a little bit. But when it's in phase one, two, and three, it can be kind of a snooze. That is what we'll call the null phase or neutral phase. But typically, that's when systems make landfall in the United States in the Caribbean and for Atlantic storms. So things get rolling during seven and eight, they make landfall during one, two, three, and they get squashed during four, five, six. So during four, five, six, just like there is a, we'll call a, a good phase for our tropical systems uh, during phases seven and eight, there's a negative phase in four, five, six, where you actually have positive pressures that are actually going to hurt the ability or suppress the ability for tropical systems to form when they get into that phase. So we may have a quiet phase trying to form during four, five, six here. Uh, that would be sometime probably looking at this at the start of September before peak season rolls around again and we are right back into the main phase. So uh, most likely, if I'm without even looking at the, the global models or ensembles, um, I would say that if we're going to have cyclogenesis, uh, right, you know, if we're going to have tropical systems forming, it's going to be within the next few days as we pass out of this really positive phase. As it moves into phase one, that's where your M uh, MDR systems are going to get going. 
your main development region systems coming off of Africa. Then for about 10 days or so, they will wander across the Atlantic before they make landfall. We'll have a couple of weeks of blah probably happening. Who knows, maybe we'll get some spin-ups in the middle of nowhere out there. And then, f happy fun time. Things get crazy again during the start of September, middle of September, right during peak season. So that is some ominous, if not concerning time. Um, the other one we want to look at is, I like this guy right here. So go ahead and uh, this is kind of a, a nice view of the tropics here. You can see, so green, green is negative potential vorticity. Negative vorticity means more spin. Uh, positive vorticity means less spin. So we have some areas of green, fairly weak area, fairly weak area of green moving across uh, the Atlantic uh, during the next week or so. Gets pretty active over, no, notice Africa's just really chugging here. Lots and lots all the way through early September. Um, this is an interesting cycle here. This means we could have some very strong waves coming off of Africa. and uh, But they, they may weaken as they approach the Gulf due to this uh, really strong positive vorticity that is going to be sitting over the eastern Pacific. So there's some fun things to look at on the CPC website. Uh, Climate Prediction Center, check it out. All right, enough with that storm. Ah, here we are. Yes, I know you all wanted to talk about. You all wanted to talk about models. Oh, I know everybody loves what's happening. Everyone saw those GFS models from a few days ago that were just like absolute doomsday. So let's see what's going on today. So this is the 12Z run from the Euro, uh, set to storm tracks from the Euro Ensemble. Uh, this is this product is available from Weather.us, which I use quite a bit for looking at Euro. I really like this particular product right here, and the ability to go through all 40 of the different Euro ensembles. Um, so what it has right here, it is has uh, it has a lot going on. Um, it appears that there's going to be a wave that makes its way into the Caribbean, and it has some intensification here. Uh, there are a couple of ensembles that really go crazy. Uh, there appears to be a bunch, a clustering of ensembles trying to form something in the Eastern Gulf. And then, of course, we have a big cluster of formations across the tropical Atlantic. There's likely not one, but two, maybe even three different waves here just in this 10-day period, which all have the potential of spinning up a little bit. With uh, Notice that these are some per fairly bright circles. Uh, Euro forecasting a Cat 1. Um, you got to remember that Euro generally under-forecasts intensity, uh, especially in these sort of setups. Um, it would be better for intensity-wise to look at GFS to see when we get a little bit closer. But this is only a 10-day timescale, so this is not exactly fantasy land. Uh, we are on the, the border of what is reliable forecasting here, look, a, looking at uh, the ensemble. So there's definitely an area of concern for MDR region uh, intensification going on, some formation here. And uh, within the next two weeks, definitely areas all along the Caribbean and East Coast should be... Uh, aware that uh, there are potential threats. I mean, we are heading towards peak season, so it makes sense, but uh, we may have a very active next two weeks, according to Euro. Let's take a look at the 18Z. Uh, all I've got, oh, I've got 18Z. We can go back to 20 or 12Z and look as well for GFS. Uh, so we can look at plain old GFS. I'm on the COD website, College of page here. Let's look at the land. Just looking at uh, 850 temps. And with the 850 temps, you can see the low pressures here. So within what I'll call forecastable time, seven days is good, 144 hours. Ten days is about the, the longest stretch of reliable that we have. And then anything past ten days is absolute fantasy land. But notice this. Um, even though this storm at 384 hours is off the coast of the U.S., which is total fantasy land. If you follow it back in time, you can see that it actually is a wave that's passing off of Africa right now. So the wave itself is, it's already here, it's already happening, it's already forming, and we probably have a potential depression at least. Let's look at the surface. 
you already have a potential depression, possibly within the next three days. So that's sort of what you'd be looking for. If we are going to, in fact, have a big hurricane just off of the East Coast doing spooky things as this westerly sort of move would be very spooky, um, you'd want to be looking for GFS to verify a depression within the next three days forming off of the African coast. Um, notice that uh, when we were on the NHC website, they didn't have anything. But the CPC guys did have it something within five days. So you can see it start to deepen a little bit here. And maybe we get a real depression again, seven to ten days out. It's a long way out. Uh, westerlies are not particularly strong right now, so these waves are moving very slowly. That gives, the, that, that gives us a lot of unsurety, unfortunately. Uh, with a stronger westerly, we would have less lead time. So. A lot of lead time here. Again, nothing terribly exciting. You get that one maybe storm on that run. What's the next run look like? So our most recent GFS run here. Again, same sort of thing. But what's this? I see a little spin up in the Gulf. The Eastern Gulf. That was uh, that was on our Euro forecast. So that's something we have to look out for. Notice that it, it basically totally missed Tropical Depression 4. Just totally whiffed on it. But it again has that tropical depression working its way across the Atlantic. And then maybe it does something off the East Coast. Maybe we'll see here. Let's look at the ensemble. I know everybody loves ensembles, so I know most of you probably don't dive too deep into ensembles. But here's some ensembles for you. I wish I could make this bigger, but God's webpage won't let, let me make it bigger. So the important thing to remember with ensembles is it's not about what the ensemble says. It's about how many ensembles say the same thing. So let's count landfalls. I'm looking at number one here. That's a gulf landfall of a tropical system. Number two, gulf landfall of a tropical system. That's two. Whoops. Let's see here. Do we got another one? Oh, no, there's another one. There's three. There's a big monster boy off the east coast, and with another one following by, that's kind of spooky. Uh, there's a fourth tropical landfall in the Gulf system. There's five, and that's a big one. East coast landfall. Look at that weird thing. That stalls. What else do we got? And there's six. There's seven. So there's seven seven ensembles out of the 20. There's actually 30. I don't have access to the other 10 uh, to show you guys right now. Um, so seven out of 20 is 35%. So right now you could say maybe there's a within the next, say, two weeks, a 35% chance of a landfalling tropical system within the Gulf of Mexico after our current landfall that we're going to have from TD4. Um, that's the sort of way that you would want to use an ensemble. You can use the Euro the exact same way. Uh, so, let's see what else do I got. All right, that is actually all I got. If you guys want to circle back talking about the storm or whatever. All right, let's see here. Do we have questions? Hey, some people showed questions. up. Anybody? Hey, it's Norm. Hey, Norm. Hey, Kyle. Student Mets, you guys can talk, so. Yeah, they're right there. You turn the. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. I've been using the website for like 20 years, and it they just updated. Oh, that looks much better on my screen now. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some, there's some jungle boys that's forecasting that that well, that one's in particular is kind of spooky two systems in a row and look at that big boy there yeah the gfs likes to do that and i like to they like to have like one trail or the other yeah the gfs tends exactly. to get kind of in a in the zone um when it so you got to remember a lot of those forecasts for mjo and a lot of those forecasts for the uh vorticity at 200 millibars those are actually based off of a GFS forecast. So when the GFS senses those, it wants to really key in on them and just go crazy with stuff. 
So a lot of times you have to consider that within a grain of salt that maybe there's kind of a little of a some multiplicity going on here. You know, a forecast of a forecast is happening. So perhaps the GFS is going a little too hard on its tropical development because something within itself is kind of overdoing the potential vorticity in its own forecast. Yeah. You know, it's like the Michael Keaton movie, you know, the copy of a copy isn't as good as the first copy. Right. Oh, God, that movie. Multiplicity. <laughs> and you have to remember that those GFS forecasts then get fed into other forecasts for global models. So a lot of these models are not, I want to say, reliant on each other, but sometimes they kind of share. Okay, Hello, also, is there anyone with, there? What's the current uh, dust looking like out in the Atlantic? Oh my gosh, Doug, you would ask about dust, wouldn't you? Oh yeah, I've been watching that. Because of course I have to go back to the Wisconsin website that was not liking me. Oh no. But thankfully, I do have Saharan air layer right here. Boom, there you go. There's your dust. So, as you can see, there's nothing in the Western Atlantic, in the Western Gulf, in the Western Caribbean right now. It is clear as a bell, which is one of the reasons why the storm had such an easy time, because there's no dry air out there. The systems currently coming off the African coast are running into an absolute buzz saw of dry air. It's not as bad as it was last year. Last year, the entire Atlantic was absolutely flooded with dry air. It was all the way to the Gulf. It was blowing all the way up to Nebraska. We were having Saharan dust storms in Nebraska. It was raining like sand during the middle of the day. So it's it's nowhere near as bad as last year. Um, that being said, there has been a very stout upper level low that had been hanging out off of the African coast, off of Mauritania and uh, uh, whatever the hell this is over here. Oh. And it had been pushing uh, it had been pushing a lot of that heat up in Africa, or out of Africa and into Europe, but also at the same time um, it had been pulling a lot of dry air out over the ocean and it's just been sitting here for a while. It is going to take quite a bit uh, for this to go away within the next couple of weeks. So it's going to take a couple of fairly good sized um, tropical waves coming off of the continent to erode these. You can see that there's some ITCZ action down here. It is not effectively going to erode this very well. But once systems do make it over to the windwards, they're going to have a lot easier time. There's a lot less dry out here. Um, the tut, the tropical upper level trough is starting to weaken. You can see it's still there just by the shape of this. We can look at upper level water vapor here. You can see it right here. There's your tropical upper level trough. Boom. There's your upper level water vapor. So you can see the dry air underneath it right here. But it's not nearly as deep as it was earlier in the season. A lot of times this trough is all the way down here below Puerto Rico. It's starting to eject and pull out a bit. And it's it's probably only a matter of time before this pulls out fully and we get the restoration of high pressure down here, which would make it a lot easier for storms to form. But again, the things are still not super favorable across the greater Atlantic. If things are going to really develop, it's going to be when they make it through the barrage, if they can survive, and then work their way either off of the, over the, let's say, north of the, the greater Antilles, that area here, is always a good area for development. Um, you remember what happened when Dorian got in this area in a sort of a similar setup. And then, uh, of course, once you hit Western Caribbean into the, into the Gulf, um, for August, that would be the primary development region that I would be worried about for U.S. landfalls would be down here, again, or up here. Again, Andrew went through the same zone. So for big stuff, we're looking in this area right now. Um, once we get into farther into September, then we'll look farther east once the tut moves out, once the drier erodes. So are the models so you, running well with uh, the dry air and the dust out there? Are they actually incorporating it into them and then seeing that and then developing uh, um, higher intensity uh, storm? 
I would say that Euro has always done a good job of doing that. Um, Euro tends to be more pessimistic about cyclone development, in particular when um, there is unfavorable conditions nearby. Um, GFS has a tendency to kind of forget that sometimes there are bad conditions, like dry air, like upper level troughs, and just develop because. Um, I don't know if that's because GFS waits the lower levels of the atmosphere, sea surface temperatures, and that sort of thing better uh, than the upper levels, and GFS and Euro tends to prefer to, to favor upper level systems, but no, that's a, that's a great question, Glenn, and I don't have the full answer to that, unfortunately. Kyle, did you have something on the meter up? Beat that. <clears throat> Somebody else have another how long, question? So how long do you think it would take for that uh, Saharan dry air, or the Saharan dust out in the uh, Atlantic? How long do you think that would take to like, erode, usually? One good wave. That's all it takes is one good wave. One good wave that just really just face plants into that dry air and eats it could potentially blow it all out of the way. This is... Um, let me pull it back up. Oof, yeah, there's your RGB. Nice. So this tier, this is a lot, yeah. But right. one good wave could take this out. One good wave could cut a path. Um, right now, again, think of this. So you've got your 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 uh five north line here. Um, or is that the the yeah, that, that's the 10 north line. You got your 10 north line. Um, ITCZ is south of 10 north. So your your waves of interest are going to be north of 10 north between between 10 and 20 generally. Um, something coming out through here can easily clear this. I notice the most intense is still to the north. This is much weaker than it was a couple of months ago. It's starting to degenerate already. And one or two more really good waves. Like if we had a good wave that came out, maybe turned into a depression or something, had some really nice convection and then died, the amount of water vapor it pulls into the air and then can... <coughs> Sorry about that. The amount of water vapor it pushes into the air and that allows it to suck that dust down and rain out um, could potentially clear it. But we need one really good wave or or system to come through and clear it before the, everything can go nuts. So figure we get a wave every three to four days. You know, it could be interesting. Um, this next wave is coming off right now. It's not particularly active, but we'll see what happens if it flares up before it gets eaten by the dry air. Maybe it survives, maybe it doesn't. Good question. Anybody else? I think mine was answered already. It's about, the, it's about dust eating convection, not editing it, but... Oh, um, so dust aiding convection, that is a temperate climate uh, thing. If you go into uh, if you go into the physics side of meteorology, um, dust serves to aid in the formation of uh, cloud and water particles. However, on the tropical side, clouds are actually formed through a different process than temperate thunderstorms and dust actually hampers the ability for cloud droplets to coalesce in that case. That's so, why I was asking, because, yeah, I was thinking of the physics, and I know that... Dust, good for storms, generally speaking, in temperate areas, so Nebraska, Texas, sure. Um, tropics, bad. It's the process that the storm... What's the cloud con why do you call it process? So you're gonna um, have you're gonna wanna go ahead and you're gonna wanna look up two processes. One is known as collision coalescence, and the other one is called the Bergeron method. Just like Tom Bergeron from TV. Yeah, I've heard of those. Um Hopefully. I remember from cloud physics that um it's much harder to get a cloud droplet if you don't have a cloud condensation nuclei. Right, right, right. And trust me, there's already plenty of cloud condensation nuclei in the atmosphere. We don't need any more. Well, 
thing about it is a lot of salt in the ocean. That's getting sprayed up, so I guess you don't need a sand. Yeah. Already. No, the the atmosphere is already full of, of dust and particles and bacteria and stupid stuff like that can that can form as nuclei. So we don't really need more. Um in the case of, of uh temperate systems, because you're forming snow instead of rain droplets. Totally different process. Uh, more dust will make more snow or faster snow accretion, so you're more likely to get convection up to a point, at which point the dust begins to have feedbacks with um, insulation processes. That insulation then creates capping and a stronger EML that prevents thunderstorms. So um, it's it's about balance, really. Mm-hmm. Oh, what was I going to look at? Oh, I wanted to look at total rainfall. So we're while we're on, when since we've got a storm here, let's look at rainfall totals in Texas. Again, nothing has been really doing well with this. Yeah, for pretty much, uh, con- sorry. I will, I will say pretty much all of the models crapped the bed with this one. Uh, you'll notice this is all related to the system that's setting up. It has zero rain, zero rain from a landfalling tropical system over the next five days. So GFS, you're done. I'm actually going to do the the great sin and look up uh, Nam. Nam actually does. This is Nam 3K. Nam 3K actually nails, not nails, but actually has a tropical system landfalling with some rain <laughs> in South Texas. So good job, Nam. Nam forecasting tropical systems again. Good job. It's hard to believe, but it is it is possible um, in weird situations where it, when models aren't properly handling a tropical system, then and only then are you allowed to look at the NAM and convection allowing models to see what they are doing with the tropical systems. And I made up this rule out of my own head after Dorian was not properly well forecasted by any of the hurricane models and NAM somehow pulled a massive super hurricane out of its ass and was correct. So, sorry to all the hurricane models, but when you fail, I will rely on my old baby. Man, these are just not... There's still quite a bit of rain. There's still 7 8 inches possible along the Texas coast. And that is a lot of rain in West Texas, and that is a, a huge amount of rain for Arizona, holy cow. Not Arizona, New Mexico. Wow. What's Rap say? Good old Rap. What's, oh, yeah. Yeah, Rap's got a lot of rain there. Did not handle the tropical system well, but... Yeah, 8 inches in West Texas, that's fun, right? You guys could use 8 inches out there. <laughs> yeah. That'll fill up the reservoirs. But yeah, uh, zero rain in Laredo sounds... No, that sounds wrong. That sounds... It, nothing is well forecasting this storm. So again, uh, let's go back to God here. Just it, It's a pretty little storm. I like this, really like their sandwich uh, option here. It looks really nice. Nice little storm. Good outflow aloft. It's getting chugging pretty good, and it's still got a nice hot tower there. Oh, I don't have a localized zoom on Campeche. They use this lame zoomed out. Oh yeah, look at those towers going on the east side. Notice that the the shear was from the southwest. It's fairly slight right now. It's about five knots. Um, so you've got downshear towers. If you want to see intensification, I want to see upshear towers. So if you start seeing towers forming on the western side of the center of circulation, that's when you know this thing is really going to go crazy and start to intensify. In the meantime, the current setup that it has with the shear that it has, I'm only forecasting slow intensification. However, 24 hours, you saw what Ripa said. Ripa said this could be a borderline hurricane within 24 hours, so we'll see. Um, this thing is moving too fast and has too little ground to work with. 
Um, because it's going to run into Mexico instead of South Texas, if it was aiming at South Texas out towards Harvey Zone, it would have another 12 to 24 hours to play with. But because it's going to hit Texas or hit Mexico re- fairly rapidly, it won't have as much time to intensify. Um, if it had a more of a northerly direction to it, you know, then I'd have more big red flags coming up. But uh, yeah, it it probably won't make a hurricane. But judging by Ripa, a high end tropical storm is seems like the most likely scenario. They got NCS right uh, east of it. I'm actually thinking about how that could interact with the tropical system. Look at it, a little cold pulling. Would you care to go over like the MJO phases uh, for this coming up weekend <laughs> or sure. stuff like that? Because I was I joined in late. So just to refresh on MJO. Cool. Well, he's got a phase named after him. He should have a question. Now, uh, so here's where we're currently at right here. We're in a very weak phase of 7 and 8. 7 and 8 are where Western Pacific into... Uh, this is basically... So Western Pacific would be like... Um, this would be just south of Mexico in the EPAC. This would be Gulf of Mexico and Western Caribbean. And then phase 1 is Eastern uh, Atlantic. So this is when it's in this phase, that means you have an increase in potential vorticity in the area. So, and, and when I say increase, I mean, it's actually a decrease. It's actually negative potential vorticity, but vorticity is negative. So you have to think about it backwards. So whenever it's in this phase, you're more likely to have convection that spins. So whenever I'm forecasting tornado outbreaks, I always look at this because if we're in a phase seven or eight, I know that we're going to have a little extra spin to the atmosphere to really make things juice up. So we're, we're currently leaving 7 and 8, going into 1. And as we do this over the next few days, we're probably going to lose a little bit of juice. Now, that may hurt the possibility of things happening over the Central Atlantic, but right now it's going to help what's going on in the Gulf. And maybe we'll, we will get something going in the Atlantic before things go away. As things phase into two and three, this is typically where landfalls happen. So storm forms, gets juiced up really good. Landfall happens for our major systems in phases two and three. These are called the null phases, one through three. This is when there is not usually anything fancy happening. We're in kind of a, a neutral phase. Phases four, five, and six is when we're on the opposite side of the planet. So on the opposite side of the planet, that means that essentially all the good stuff's over there. All the vorticities over there, the Earth is, the atmosphere is shorter over there. Over here on our side, the atmosphere is fatter, and that reduces vorticity. You have to remember, vorticity, in reality, is just space trying to suck you out into the void. That's what it is. So when the atmosphere is shorter, you get low pressure, and space tries to suck you out into the void and kill you. But when you have high pressure, that's the Earth trying to hold you in and hold you close to its heart. And therefore, the atmosphere is a little fatter. So during the negative phase, from 4 through 6 or so, it'll actually suppress uh, tropical cyclone and tornado development, potentially, before we head back around to 7 and 8. Now, if we look at our forecast here for the next couple of weeks, it looks like in the next 14 days or so, we're going to start going to that negative phase, probably through the start of uh, September only to re-emerge into the most dangerous phase, 7 and 8, would be my guess, if we extrapolate this further around, because we're typically on a one-month cycle, we'll probably emerge during into 7 and 8, into 1, in the most dangerous phase right during the middle of September. So, I would say that while we might have a couple of storms within the next 4 to 5 days that pop up, more likely we'll have a pretty quiet end of August into the start of September before middle September goes absolutely crazy. That would be my guess. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I appreciate it. They suck you in, huh? It's it's <clears throat> suck, sucking you out. Actually, the void is trying to suck you off up into space. That's what low pressure is. No, uh, not that I. Oh, never mind. <laughs> 
Low pressure is when there's a lot of less mass and other mass is trying to come in to fill it. It's more like right. you right. Right. think about it. It's more like it's more like the atmosphere trying to push you up. Right, right. There's into a space. void that's, that's trying to be filled. It's trying to push you up into space. Yeah. That's I mean, if you really dive down into the depths of what things really mean, it's that low pressure is the atmosphere trying. So, yeah, because it's not happy that there's not enough mass in that area, and the more mass, the more mass is happy to atmosphere. See, the more you think about it, the more sense it makes, and the more scary it gets. Do we have yeah. another? Any other questions, ladies and gents? Uh, Julian asked, "Do you think the more westerlies would help influence more development in the system?" Uh, I think the more westerlies would be nice. Um, so there's a couple of benefits and downsides to strong westerly. Strong westerlies can actually create their own shear. Um, so if I look at where's one with winds that that's not what I want to see. Let me pull up the right thing. So westerlies are awesome because they're again what's going to push our waves from the east to the west along the intertropical convergence zone or just north of it. Downsides. Too strong of westerlies can actually shear a system to death. That happened quite a bit last year. We had some super strong westerlies last year. On the flip side, obviously, if you don't have enough westerlies, you're going to get easterlies that will absolutely shred and destroy your system. Um, so easterlies tend to be a product of a upper-level high. So let us imagine, or sorry, an upper level low. Let us imagine there's an upper level low sitting somewhere over, let's say, the Caribbean. The upper level low is going to have winds going around counterclockwise. Those easterlies will just shred you to death. On the other hand, westerlies are usually the sign of a fairly strong high pressure. Now, high pressure is good for two things, remember? The high pressure will not only provide westerlies for your system to run along nice and easy, but it will also provide divergence aloft. Divergence aloft is key for your cells to be able to vent. It also induces convergence at the surface. So, yes, westerlies would be great, but again, westerlies are typically the product of a strong high pressure, which we have not had so far this year. We've had a couple of fairly strong troughs across the Atlantic instead. I would, love to, I would love to see a nice high pressure over the Atlantic somewhere just to get some storms going, because they're entertaining. But uh, for the sake of keeping storms out of the United States, you want to see troughs off the coast. That's it. Just lots of troughs. What affects the amount of dust over the Atlantic? The amount of dust in the Atlantic is a combination of factors, primarily the velocity of winds coming off of Africa, which are largely based off of where the current storm systems are set up. Um, Africa and the coast just off of Africa tends to have... Oh, let's see if I can go back here. Tends to have systems that are very slow-moving and or stagnant. Think like red eye of Jupiter level stagnant. Uh, one of those common things is an upper low off of the coast of Morocco and Mauritania. That's the word I wanted to say, Morocco? Yes. Uh, yes Morocco. That, is a, that is a very dry upper level low that sits off the coast. It does not feed moisture in to Spain or anything like that. It just feeds heat and sand up into the continent. Um, this is just a burning mass of heat all across northern Africa here. Everything below 20, everything above 20 north is just dry. There are very few waves that move across it. And unfortunately, due to climate change, um, that little area where it is super dry has started shifting south. So areas like Lake Chad are now bone dry. So we've had a lot more African dust in the last decade, let's say, than we'd ever had in the past. Um, African dust has been a fixture um, of heading across the Atlantic for literally thousands, tens of thousands of years. Um, the reason why there is red clay in North Carolina 
is because that red clay comes from sand in Africa. Um, all of that dust is and sand is deposited along the East Coast due to literally millions of years of weather patterns bringing it over here. Um, relatively weak uh, westerlies are bringing it over. Uh, weak, dry westerlies just slowly moseying it on right across. It floats in the atmosphere because it's of a certain particle size that doesn't sink. And it lands on your shores in the southeast. And now in Nebraska, apparently. Isn't that what also built up a ton of Caribbean islands? Yes, yes. There is a lot of red sand on the Caribbean islands as well. I noticed that All of the ones Florida, that don't have black sand. On the Florida beaches, there are spots where there was uh, like red sand. Yep, it comes from Africa. So, what is that dependent on? Well, it depends on how how much wind there is, which is a feedback of how hot it's been. The hotter it is, the windier it tends to be. Um, a reminder that uh, going back to your synoptic meteorology class, that strong surface heating tends to cause greater mixing. More mixing means more wind. More wind upsets more dust. You get more dust storms. Those dust storms, you know, get lofted and then eventually end up in the United States. Um, another factor is the the humidity or lack thereof. Um, there has been a severe drought across much of Africa, in particular East Africa. That is actually a downstream thing. Um, approximately, they estimate 20% of the rain in East Africa is due to farming in India. Um, India, for the last 10,000 years approximately, has been a giant rice paddy, um, growing rice and cultivating rice and producing a huge amount of evapotranspiration. Um, for tens of thousands, for a ten thousand years, then that evapotranspiration has impacted the ability for tropical systems and, and uh, basically our our thunderstorms that are you know eventually impact us to form over the Arabian Sea, over East Africa. Form storms move all the way across the sub-Saharan continent and into the Atlantic. Well, without those farmers growing rice anymore because they got paid to grow corn, which they're not outgrowing because all the crops failed, because no one ate corn, and because it was a giant mess. I, it's a long story. Moral of the story, all the farmers gave up or got bought out by American conglomerates, so now they're not growing rice anymore, and so now it's not raining in East Africa, so now we're getting less waves. And there's more dust. Good job, Monsanto. Oh, that's one way to get rid of hurricanes. <laughs> mm. There's another wonderful theory out there. Um, a lot of the moisture that we get from the Gulf um, and the Caribbean actually comes off of the Amazon. And now that the Amazon is being slowly wielded away by farming, the ability for that really deep tropical moisture to get pumped up uh, through the Caribbean, through the Gulf, and into the U.S. has been severely diminished. And therefore, that may hurt potentially our tornado chances, but also severely impact our uh, early and late season uh, tr uh, tropical, uh, what do I want to say, cyclogenesis. Sorry, guys, I'm like four beers and a uh, gin and tonic deep right now. Oh, wow. Hey, I got a good question for you. Now, with all this that's been not happening, let's put it that way, out in the Atlantic. And we notice the sea surface temperatures, they're pretty much peaking and staying near there, but it, there's another thing that's being affected. It's the water column. How deep that energy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, oh, gosh, where do I have, I know I've got something for this here. Let's see if Tidbits has it. I don't know if Tidbits has OHC. Ocean we don't have many systems Eastern using Eastern. that energy. It just stores it. It's a big battery being weighted so to be used. That's a, that's a really great point that you make there. Um, when you have sea surface, that then upwells water and cools the water down. So effectively, that is what we call a negative feedback. Because instead of the water getting warmer and warmer, it gets reversed back down. So there's a negative feedback. What we have occurring right now is a positive feedback. So because there is super, super warm water, 
but there's no storms forming, the water gets warmer and warmer. And as it does so, as it mixes down and continues to heat more and more and more. So now you have really, really absurdly high oceanic heat content really far east. These sea surface temps, all the, okay, it's only August, and you have sea surface temps that can sustain a tropical system all the way to the fucking Azores. That should not be possible. That is absolutely bonkers. 26Z, or 26C, all the way to the Azores. Dumb. I will well, find this Wisconsin website. I will find it. Well, I've got another question. So, <clears throat> if the uh, thermohaline shuts down in the North Atlantic, how would that affect the uh, sea surface temperatures across the ocean? That's a great question. Like, um, would, it, would it go from suddenly warm to freezing cold, or so? Um, if the if the thermohaline circulation shuts down, that what that means is, is there will no longer be meridional transport. So meridional means north to south. So currently in the Atlantic, the meridional transport of the Gulf Stream pushes warm to the northeast up towards Iceland, which is why Iceland is twelve. And uh, let's see here, what's this? Newfoundland is zero. So, and then on the flip side, it pulls cooler air down south here along the East African coast. So imagine that you erase this, see the yin-yang? There's your meridional spin due to the yeah. thermohaline circulation. In a future weather scenario, where the thermohaline circulation slows or shuts down, the yin-yang stops and it simply goes straight across. So now the hot, the, the warm water essentially it goes straight across. Uh, I would I would say it'd be a lot closer to, um, sort of the situation we have here east of east of Japan, where essentially you have a straight line, where you have a very very warm setup that goes straight over to cold, which we have kind of right now. But notice it pulls north. Theirs is almost due straight east west because their thermohaline is spread out over a much larger area. So for the most part, um. Our East Coast would not be impacted much, other than the fact that the recirculation that occurs down from Newfoundland would probably stop at a certain point, and you probably would get less uh, upwelling along the East Coast. You might get warmer waters in the, let's say, like up to New Jersey, New York City area, which would potentially mean that any storms that go to that area could live a lot longer or intensify, even if they were heading north. Um, on the flip side, a lot of the systems that are fish out in the middle of nowhere potentially would run into a bunch of cold water. Um, the Bermuda-type storms would, would cease to exist or weaken much quicker. Um, but on the flip side, down here, there'd be less cold water entrainment from the north. So you likely would have much more, much stronger um, waves coming off the African coast that would intensify much quicker. You could have a much more active MDR region, and then basically a, a a quieter North Atlantic for our tropical systems. Um, as for the Gulf itself, if the thermohaline shuts down, that also means that the Gulf Eddy likely shuts down. So you no longer get the really intense Gulf Eddies um, in the Central Gulf like we currently have, like this tropical system is about to head into, this super hot eddy. Um, However, it probably won't do much. I mean, the Gulf is already really warm. It's already in an ideal spot for really intense warming. It's totally surrounded. There's no cold air bodies. But it's not super deep. Um, yeah, I don't think it would impact tropical systems that much in the United States. But I would expect more development in the MDR and less fish storms. That's interesting. Though, um, if on the, the flip side... Oh. On the flip side, um, California would become a tornado, or not a tornado, but a hurricane playground. Um, without the California current, um, you'd have to, all of these 26 and 27 temps would last all the way to LA, and you would have a very active tropical season in California, similar to what we had during the 1930s. Hmm. Would that be part of that whole uh, 100 inches of rain in California in a month? Yes, yes. So uh, we, we, you might remember there was uh, a, yeah. there's, there's some historical conjecture going on that California used to be an island. Um, it may not be totally implausible or crazy, 
Um, it appears that the Gulf of California at one point extended all of the way through the Southern California desert, all the way up to the Sacramento area, where the river then provided a freshwater transport that allowed you to go either direction, effectively turning all of Southern California into an island, even though it would have been separated by a freshwater river to the north side. And uh, there was the Great Sacramento Flood we all have heard about in the past, where it rained an absolutely astonishing amount. I don't remember how much it was. It was a lot um, that that basically turned the valley into an inland sea temporarily. Um, it's possible that during the 1600s, that was a permanent fixture in the California had been an island for possibly hundreds of years, maybe thousands. It would explain a lot of things. Uh, how far ago? Uh, 1600s. California likely was an island in the 1600s. Uh, okay. At least the southern, basically from San Francisco all the way to um, all the way down to the Baja was separated from the mainland by a freshwater river to the north and then by a coastal, by a, a, uh, a very thin, skinny uh, Gulf of Baja um, to the east. Gotcha. It was actually they. It was actually traversable by ship all the way around the entire island. Uh, uh, there so... are there are maps of it that they there are both. Uh, I think Spanish, French, and a couple of other nations have maps of it that confirm this. Okay, normal. Interesting. Question. Anyway, so... back to the main topic. So how is uh, sea surface temps or uh, sea surface temp anomalies right now compared to how, like previous other years? Oh baby, that's a great question. They are warm, but here's the thing I want you to remember: um, climatology has been updated fairly recently. We're now eighty-one through two thousand ten, so that means that some of the warmest years on the record, post like ninety-five to now, like. 15 of the warmest years in history are now into the record. So anomalies don't mean that much anymore. At least not from an Atlantic point of view. We are still above average. We're still a half to one degree above average across most of the Atlantic. Um, and that's a half to one degree of C, not of F. So we're one to two F above average. What was the previous data set? Uh, the previous data set would have been... Uh, that would have been 1970 to 2000, or 1971 okay. to 2000. Uh, within the last seven days, uh, we've seen some pretty good warming across the Caribbean region. Caribbean and Gulf have been warming. Here's your uh, El Nino 3.4 I was talking about earlier. Notice that we were supposed to come out of El Nino during July, or at La Nina during July, and then it just came back with a vengeance. We're now during a moderate La Nina. And I still so, will find a way to show you OHC. So I'm what does that say? It. So what does that moderate La Nina say about this year's hurricane season? A moderate La Nina usually indicates an active hurricane season. Um... So what's the forecast right now? Like 18 storms? Something like that? That sounds about right. A moderate La Nina would be like 18 storms. Sometimes a super low, like a really hardcore La Nina, there's not a lot of correlation to that because there haven't been that many, but moderate La Nina should be an above average season. Even with a light La Nina that we were supposed to have, we were supposed, supposed to have a gangbuster season. But I think that just our problem right now is that we're about to head into a pretty negative phase for MJO and potential vorticity for the next couple of weeks. That may stifle the first half of the really active late August, early September season. Like, we're just getting into that sort of niche right now where the cyclones really want to go, but the current global synoptic setup is not favorable for tropical development overall until we get to that swing around on MJO, in which case, if things line up correctly, uh, the middle to later half of September could go just bonkers. I mean, that would be my forecast on a typical year anyway, but it looks like everything is lining up for it to happen. Uh, 
Anything else, Jens? I know you're all eagerly awaiting the new GFS to run to come in. Yes. Oh, I can feel it. It's so close. Oh, what's that? Rap is picking it up now. Oh, maybe a little bit. Man, that's a lot of rain. That's a lot of rain. This is kind of an off-topic question, but um, how is the uh, what? What's forecasted for next year? Are we supposed to still be in that uh, La Nina phase through the spring, twenty twenty-three? You missed out earlier. I was talking. I was on the CPC website. Um, the forecast does for, is for us to go into a slight El Nino uh, early next spring. So, fingers crossed. We could get an El Nino because we could use the moisture big time. That El Nino would bring a good precip to the southwest, right? Typically, a spring El Nino will bring a lot of moisture to the southwest, to California, bring a lot of snowfall to that area. It's a, it's a, it's a good setup. Um, and that area really could use that rain right now. I don't know. That I don't know if that's necessarily going to be true after the next week if we do get flooding rains in Texas and the Southwest due to these tropical systems. But wouldn't that also uh, be a lower tornado, uh, being unfavorable for uh, active tornado season for El Nino? Uh, historically, El Nino does have... Let's go back to CPC. That drought monitor outlook is beautiful. Yeah, it's a nice tool. Oh, I love seeing uh, all that drought relief. Let's see here. So let's look at La Nina here. Um, historically, if we're looking for really bonkers tornadoes, having a slight to moderate La Nina is the best. Notice our 2010 to 2012 time period was exactly that. Um, we have currently been in the same time period, but we haven't had too many crazy tornado outbreaks. Oh, wait, I take that back. Yes, we have. Um, so what what my best prediction would be is that it's currently forecasting us to hit an El Nino sometime in the spring. So a, an El Nino starting in the spring. What's a good analog for that? That would probably be 97 and 98 is probably the best analog there. I know oh. 97 was a pretty quiet season. Oh. But my thing is that also, looking at that, it looks like it came off of a uh, a one-year La Nina, though, in 96, and then an El Nino in 95. I can really care less how much, uh, how many years the La Ninos have been going on for. Um... It's more about the. It's less about where you have been and more about where you're going. It's more about the derivative. So, uh, 1991 was Hurricane Bob. That was the big one. Is it another big factor for first versus second year Ninas, the uh, amount of drought, too? Well, and that see that's that's a little uh, that's a little a different thing. Um, first year La Nina, you've probably got a short term drought forming. A second year La Nina, you're now into a long term drought. So that has different implications for uh, thunderstorm development, things like that. Versus El Ninos, there really is no such thing as a second year El Nino. Um, we almost had a two-year El Nino during the 87 cycle. That was a pretty intense method or time. Uh, 97 was about a year-long El Nino. Um, it was a super El Nino. Notice it was all the way in the 2.4 range. Um, it was very intense. Uh, you guys might remember the Chris Farley sketch, I am El Nino, was yeah. because that El Nino that year was so strong. 
But since then, we've had a bunch of wuss El Ninos. Um, that, I guess I take that back. There was a Super El Nino 2015 to 2016, but it was largely negated by the ridiculously resilient ridge, which prevented there from being nearly as much rain in California as we needed. So that's another factor you have to remember. Uh, MJO and El Nino are teleconnections, meaning they're connected to other massive factors, massive patterns across the planet. The ridiculously resilient ridge is a new teleconnection that has formed out of nowhere, essentially. And we have to factor that in when forecasting weather for the, uh, the Pacific Coast and for the Midwest and that sort of thing. Now, hypothetically, what if we'd go into a third year La Nina? What would be your expectations for uh, 2023? In terms of, like, you know, if, if we're going to be talking about an active tornado season or hurricane season, like, how would that alter? Because I, I, I'm not. If, uh, if we get. If we stick to another full year of La Nina, I'm expecting a lot more wildfires. I'm expecting a lot less tornadoes due to a really, really dry surface. And the wildfire presence, which um, uh, extreme wildfires have been known to suppress tornado development. Um, a little bit of wildfire development has been known to be positive, but at the level that we've been having for the last 10 years has not been positive. So uh, another year of La Nina would be a, another stick in the mud for tornadoes in the th traditional development region, the Tornado Alley. You would you stick to south, stick to the southeast if you want tornadoes. If we have La Nina again, but so I, I'm sorry if I'm asking questions about like this off-topic stuff, but um, like how do El Ninos affect like Dix, Does it affect Dixie Alley in any way? So like if we're going to be heading into an El Nino for 2023, like how would that alter like Dixie Alley, or would it just not matter? Traditionally, you want to be in a La Nina or heading into a La Nina if you want a really active Dixie Alley season. Um, for for a good traditional tornado plane season, um, you don't want to be in an El Nino or a La Nina. You want to be in the middle zone somewhere. Um, maybe we'll hit that sweet spot in the spring because we'll be moving from La Nina to El Nino. Or maybe it will fail again because we were supposed to be in El Nino this year and it hit spring and just did a big 180 and just crapped on us. As seen by this graph right here, it, it oh, here we go, we're going to hit El Nino and crapped on us. So, it, it was, yeah. On neutral phase. We're supposed to be in El Nino. Yep, well, neutral phase and nope, back to El Nino suck. Neutral phase is ideal for tornadoes. Do you think that uh, 2023 can uh, look similar to 2013? Oh, that's a deep question. Um, I Seven, have, uh, I have twenty. Okay, go ahead. Uh, from a climatological standpoint, I have no uh no indications that they would be similar. No. Okay. I would say that if this year was going to be like any other year, it would probably be like twenty twenty one, as depressing as that sounds, or maybe from a tropical standpoint, like twenty eleven. No, I was thinking tornado season. Oh, well, dry and kind of crappy sounds like 2021 or 2020 to me. But again, maybe we'll get an El Nino. Maybe we will. I noticed uh, 20 was isn't 2021 kind of loosely like 2011, except worse. No, 2011 was a freak of nature. Uh, 2021, eh. 20, last year was kind of kind of boring, relatively. I mean, sure, there were some good tornadoes, but they weren't stereotypical. I mean, 20, 2012 is a good analog for 2022. Um, I don't know. I was going to say, if we do manage to go into a weak, weak El Nino, um, the Andover tornado is a good... Uh, there's uh, Gerald, Texas... Oh, Gerald was 97. Gerald okay. was 97. That yeah. was an El Nino year. Andover's an El Nino year. Andover, uh, uh, 91 Andover? Yeah, Andover, 91. So, again, not particularly big outbreaks, but uh, there were some significant tornadoes during those years in the classic regions. Um, so, it would be nice to get an El Nino. We could use the moisture. The moisture would help mo moisten up the soil. 
provide more vapor transpiration would would return the planes to their greatness. I could use a couple of good years of El Nino around here. Anything else now that we've gotten super off topic? Oh, I'm wondering, over the next few years, like, could we see the plains go from, like, extreme drought to being extremely wet and just back and forth over, like, a few years? Well, that is, that, again, that is one of the great predictions of climate change is that we're going to go rapidly between feast and famine. Um, a reminder that within the past, what, 12 years, um, the Missouri River in Omaha has gone to massive flood stage twice no three times i want to say and now we're in our worst drought in recorded history drier than the dust bowl so all within like a 10 to 12 year period so we're going from one extreme to the other rapidly back and forth who knows where it'll land no whammy no whammy that sort of thing Kind of hope now we go into a neutral phase for 2023. I just, I'm on a good tornado season. Yeah, I do too. Man, it's been a while. It's been a while. Last one was either like 2019 or 2016, right? Hey, I'm from Nebraska. It was 2014, okay? I thought 2021 was pretty decent. Well, it just depends on where you are, I 2021 suppose. 2021 was my first year, and I found it fun. Hey. 2021 had the second largest tornado outbreak in the last, like, 40 years in December in Nebraska and Iowa. Yeah, but uh, well, from a chasing perspective, great. that's just garbage. It was total garbage. I was there. But, uh, no, from a, chasing, from a chasing standpoint, it's been it's been rough the last few years, yes. Yeah, I... There haven't been any classical outbreaks since probably 2014, so. Maybe two, there was one in 2016. Yeah, Dodge City? Yeah. So, do we have any tropical-related questions? Otherwise, I'm just going to log. Nothing from the peanut gallery? All right, gentlemen, thank you for attending. Thank you so much for listening to me blather on for like an hour and a half. Glenn, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Well, since uh, Glenn's uh, not talking, I guess I'll be the new host. <laughs> so how's Ohio been, Norman? We actually had rain today in Omaha. Oh my gosh, it rained. It's a miracle. I suck. Yeah. Listen, I got, I got seventeen hundredths of an inch of rain today. I, I, I going back to like the 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 El Nino La Nina tornado season gibberish. Like, I feel like the past couple. It, at least this year and last year has been like qua like quality over quantity, like yeah, absolutely. Like been some really good tornadoes the last few years. Like there just have been a lot of them. Like I, I thought this year like is a really good example of just like quality over quantity. Like my last tornadoes were in May, but my God, they were amazing. You could like if you got all the tornadoes this year, you could you, you can consider it a good uh, good spring. Yeah, I th I thought that it was a good spring this year, to be honest. I mean, but I, I feel like the Ohio Valley hasn't woke up in a while. Midwest has been dead. Yeah, the last good Midwest Honestly. event was definitely August 9th. Oh, yeah, October so, 11th, I think. Here's a little blast from the past for you. The last time we had a triple La Nina was 73, 74, 75, 76. That was the last triple in we had. What happened during 73, 74, 75, 76? Uh, super outbreak. Yep. Super, 
And don't forget the Omaha suit, the Omaha, like, Easter, uh, not Easter, uh, the Omaha May outbreak. That was pretty savage. 76 was the super outbreak, right? No, 74. 74. 74. Okay. And then the Omaha yeah. outbreak was 75. Which yeah, so... The Omaha the, tornado at the time was the most expensive tornado in a U.S. history, and it stayed that way for, like, 20 years. So, but here's the problem, though. The, back then, though, the wildfires weren't that crazy, though, were they? No, no. There were. It was very rare to have wildfires like we do now during La Nina. So then I, I wonder if an El Nino for this year would be good. Because, like, considering the, me, the mega drought, we hamper the drought. I mean, we still would have a drought, kind of, out there, but, like, not as bad. So, going back where we've had La Nina's going into an El Nino for the next spring. Again, I don't have a lot of proxies. Um, the best one that I have is probably 91 and 97. So again, not super active seasons, but some good quality tornadoes in the classical areas. So essentially another quality over quantity type season. Yep. Okay, I'm fine with that. Uh, yeah, 80, 82 is another good proxy. No, nah, maybe not 82. How was Dixie, though, uh, there for those years? Uh, you gotta remember, Dixie actually wasn't super active until, like, the 2000s. Um, there have been always been Dixie tornadoes, but Dixie being a primary tornado alley is a relatively new feature. And before, the Ohio Valley is going extinct. I know yeah, the... the Ohio Valley used to be the, the shit. Uh, the the mid Ohio Valley in the Midwest used to have quite frequent major tornado outbreaks. Like the Midwest, you, in like the '60s, and used to have early spring outbreaks. Yeah, '30s, uh, '40s, uh, '50s, '60s, '70s. This makes me think, though. I wonder if there's something that we haven't discovered yet, to where, like, every decade or every ten to twenty years, like the cycle like rotates, like in the U.S. That's what like, I was thinking, because. Like, what caused like, all the Midwest outbreaks to stop? Yeah, because, like, and now we're transitioning to Dixie Alley. Like, you know, what's... Are we going to think in, like, twenty the 2030s or 2040s? I, I think well, we're anthropogenic. It. Sorry. No, you you said anthropogenic. So I, you're yeah. on the right track. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're talking about cycles, but the thing is, we have anthropogenic forcing now in the climate, so we need to not think about cycles, because we're, we're heading off a cycle. Yeah. This new territory so wise. basically, all the cycles that we had are now being pushed into territories where they might not cycle anymore. Uh, you may have broken them out of their cycle, so they may be what's called a runaway. Um, one of those factors is low placement. Um, due to climate change, possibly, um, a trough over eastern Canada and the Hudson Bay is now a almost permanent fixture due to the failure of the polar vortex. This polar vortex failure forces low pressures that would normally head from Colorado straight across the Midwest, straight across Nebraska and Kansas, making tornadoes, straight into Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, former very strong tornado-influenced areas, Suddenly, those lows can't move straight east because there's a giant trough to the north. They have to dip south. And that southerly dip is now creating the systems that we see creating our super outbreaks in the southeast. So, you think, so I wonder if you think it's likely now the next super outbreak will probably be in the south. Uh, I, I would say that based on the current pattern setups... The majority, if not all, of the super outbreaks that we're going to see of traditional outbreaks. I'm not talking what we had in December. That derecho thing was a weird fucking thing. I'm talking traditional super outbreaks will primarily only occur in the southeast now due to the change in where the lows are forming and where they're moving. Now, could that could that all change, though? Could that, like, revert back to the Midwest? Uh, I, I doubt it, because that low-pressure... Uh, forming over Hudson Bay is based on the fact that Hudson is a bay and it's cold. And so that will probably even get stronger. Um, there's a possibility that the northeastern U.S. may get colder even as a result of this. So long term, it may set in stone. I mean, like, 
the last time this happened, a thing called the Ice Age happened. So um, you're talking a, a pattern change that could last tens of thousands of years. Hold on, I have to kill a spider. I think is there have. It's just me, or does it seem like the early spring outbreaks, early spring events in the Midwest are on the uptick again? You know, I've noticed that. I've noticed that, like, we, we're we getting more December. We're getting more late season early. More, like, more, like, like more even events. events like Rochelle or something. Yeah, like, we, we've we been getting, like, like I, March I feel 28th like... March 28th would have been a massive event if it didn't get crap to shit by rain. Yeah. So well, I just I just want to remind you that uh, out of season stuff happening either extremely early in the spring or extremely late in the fall are now possible due to climate change. TM. I want to add something about the uh, outbreaks in the southeast. Um, there have been I know that you said that the uh, areas wake quote unquote waking up in the two thousands, but there have been historic outbreaks in the southeast prior to that. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there have been historic outbreaks in Massachusetts. Um, and the reason why I say that the area is waking up is because the the increase of tornado frequency in the southeast has not been to, due to reporting. It has not been due to expansion or population increases or any of those other things that have led to the increase in reporting in the Plains. The Plains historically has been a very desolate area. And so the advent of chasing and, and meteorology and all that stuff has increased the ability for people to find storms there. The southeast, on the other hand, has been densely populated for hundreds of years, and outbreaks of the magnitude that we have seen have not been extremely commonplace at the rate that we are seeing them. They did happen, but not as much as we've seen in the last 20 years. So are you? So then are you a believer of Tornado Alley shifting east? Uh, absolutely. Um, with the 100th meridian shifting east as rapidly as it is, that's going to greatly decimate the EML across the traditional Tornado Alley area. Um, traditional Tornado Alley may, may move completely out of uh, western Nebraska, western Kansas, and western Oklahoma, and, and even the panhandle of Texas within the next few years. They it may move, move into like Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to move east. It's just that the areas that we classically thought you know, if you drew a line from, say, Norfolk, Nebraska, down to Lubbock, and then filled it in, you know, several hundred miles east down to, say, Dallas, up to, like, Des Moines, that would be what we think of as classic Tornado Alley. But the western half of that area is going to be decimated by a super dry EML within the next couple of years. It already is. Um, we've seen that by massive, massive forecast failures across that region over the last few years. The email is just too dry. There's no surface moisture. There's there's wildfires everywhere. Um, now that area is gonna get. It's all gonna turn into eastern Colorado. I mean, you're still gonna get some small tornadoes. You're still gonna get landspouts and stuff. But there's not enough email moisture for really really big tornadoes, except for during unusual setups. I mean, you okay. can still get lucky over the winter, though, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what you're relying on. You're relying on on unusual off 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 classic setups then. So, but here's the thing, though. I mean, we've had years. I think it was last year where I think si or Michael Gavin said that like anything west of 35 is going to be complete trash. There's hard, there's hardly going to be anything. Just forget about it. It's it's done. It's over essentially. But we got some really good shit last year, like uh, west of 35. So, like, my whole his, thing is like his, I, statement, I just... his statement is cutting and slashing a bit too drastically. Is everything th west of 35 going to be trash? He's probably right 90% of the time. All of the storm setups that would have been awesome before, 90% of them are going to be trash now because of this current setup. And saying that you had a good year is anecdotal evidence. So, yeah, you'll probably have a good year every once in a while, but it will be a lot less likely you're going to have good years. It's all about probabilities, my man. So just... your, prob your probabilities of chasing west of 35 going down your probabilities of chasing east of 35 well okay but if you want to really chase guess what you're chasing in in kentucky you're chasing in alabama you're chasing in mississippi now how about china china that's another great like magical freak climate change thing 
You know, people have had cell phones in China for more than the last year, but just in the last couple of years, magically, boom, Tornado Alley in central China. It's pretty crazy. Uh, well, I wish I, wish I would be able to uh, go over there. Well, the problem is it's virtually unchaseable because they don't have a road network, and the uh, geography is impossible. It is extraordinarily diverse, both from a vegetational standpoint and from a uh, topography mm. standpoint. Okay. It's like... The entire eastern half of China is like trying to chase in the Ozarks. Oof. Yeah. But imagine that the Ozarks were like rainforest. I mean, I've seen pictures of uh, I mean, tornadoes kind of there and just vast open plains. Oh, that's the thing, though. They do have open plains, but those open plains are surrounded by hills and valleys and mm. mountain ranges and stuff all over the place. Kind of like so, how Arkansas but, is on the east side. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there's a big open plain mm-hmm. in eastern Arkansas, but the rest of the place is mountainous as shit. You I know, wonder there's, if... a, there's a big open plain in the middle of, in the, of California, but it's surrounded by fucking mountains. So and I wonder... how uh, all of China is. So I wonder if if the, the if it's true about how Tornado Alley is shifting east, then Ohio is going to rise again eventually. See, that's the problem. It's not just east. It's also shifting south in that area, too, because you have that influence of that upper-level trough over the Great Lakes and the Hudson Valley. The Great Lakes are the great standard in the United States. People don't realize how much of an impact they have, how influential they are. They're the largest body of freshwater on the freaking planet, number one. They retain a huge amount of cold air and cold, cold, just cold in them that impacts the local weather. But also, that coldness brings low pressure right overhead. And that low pressure is going to totally mess you up. Because it's not a happy low pressure system that brings tornadoes. It's an upper level trough is what it's going to bring right over. So then, do you think like our active season here in the Ohio Valley, um, like our peak seasons could change variably? Because like, I know what Jimmy was saying about how like Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky... Like, we've been getting really good shit from, like, you know, even, like, in the latter half of the fall. So, what like, you wanna, I was going to say, late fall is, fall might be an interesting uh, scenario there, because as summer moves in, obviously summer is going to suppress a lot of storm systems. But with summer, you're still going to have ridging over the southeast. That ridging will be partially remnant and prevent that trough from moving in early. You then have a trough trying to establish itself with pieces of energy moving in from the northwest, moving into what is a fairly warm, moist ridge. That could potentially be an activation zone, a, a you know, a zone where the, the things things are going to get spicy. So there is potentially some second season upside to that. Similarly, on the flip side, there might be some primary season action again during the summer, but again, that's, again, it just, that summer trans transverse over, you guys don't have that wonderful Rockies that we have, you don't have that wonderful cyclogenesis during the spring. So that's one of the things that hurts you. Before, you were relying on cyclogenesis due to troughs over the northwestern U.S. Troughs don't come through the northwestern U.S. anymore. They just don't. They come through the northern plains into the Ohio Valley. I don't know if it's just me, but I do feel like in early spring, the Midwest is becoming more active again. Yeah, that's what I was kind of saying. Like, I feel like, I feel like, you know, we're probably going to have more of an active, like, fall and winter sort of severe weather in the Ohio Valley. Like, damn, I never would have thought, I would never thought, at least starting out in my career, I'd never see a, a tornado in December, let alone a fucking violent. Pretty nuts. Yeah, like, I, that... I, I don't know. I'm still just baffled by climatology because it, I, I feel like climatology is something that, you know, we could try to think we know, but like in some aspects, we just could absolutely just turn shit on. Well, that's the, super, the point of understanding climatology is that it's statistics. It's just statistics. You got to understand everything is percentages. If I say there's a 99% chance it's not going to rain today, I'm acknowledging there's a 1% chance I could be wrong. So, and that's what people don't get about stats. They don't get about climate. It's, when you're making a forecast based on climate, you know that you're probably wrong. All of our forecasts we know are wrong. If, I, if, I'm, if you look at a CAM model today, if you look at the HRRR, 
and the HRRR, let's say, did a really, really good job today, you still knew it was wrong because there's no way in hell the HRRR got every single shower and thunderstorm that popped right. up. You're, what you're doing is you're trying to interpret something as, as as reality, but it's not. It's just a facsimile. It's just a guess on what is going to happen. And whether it's wrong or right, is it's not about being wrong or right. It's about how well it did relative to what actually happened. Not if it got it right or wrong per se. It's not black and white. It's all gray. Climatology is the same way. It's all gray. You know, I could say that, you know, based on changes in climate or based on the current climate setup, you know, the odds of you having a violent tornado in Grand Teton, Wyoming is 0.01%. But guess what? That means there's still a one out of every 10,000 years you're going to get a violent tornado in Grand Teton, Colorado, or in Grand Teton, Wyoming. And we know that that can happen because it has happened in the 80s. Yeah, I, I understand. Like, so... Like, I just don't know. Like, I feel like, I mean, do you think that going back to earlier about the whole like winter, I wonder if winter could be like the new, like I said, like the new thing for like the Ohio Valley and, you know, like I think it's kind of shifting north. Not, I'm not saying that Alabama, Mississippi is like losing anything. I just feel like the area is broadening out. So I want to remind you that I went to school for meteorology during 2002 to 2006. And so when I took my severe storms classes, we acknowledged that there was a winter season across mainly East Texas into the Southeast that was predominantly December through February. That was the winter season. And you would have occasional tornado outbreaks during that season. They happen once or twice a year. You get a few tornado watches. You might even have 10 or 20 tornadoes. Oftentimes they were severe tornadoes. Oftentimes they were very poorly forecast. Because the SPC had a really horrible, horrible skill of predicting tornado outbreaks during the winter. It was worse than luck. That's how bad it was. Worse than luck on their skill score. They've gotten a lot better at doing stuff like that. But at the same time, that season has expanded. There is now, it's not just December, January, February in Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida. It's not just that anymore. Suddenly, everything has blown all the way up to Nebraska, to Ohio. Suddenly, everything has expanded all the way from October, all the way through, almost all the way, like, through December, skip two months, and then it starts back over, you know, and then we go back into traditional season. So there's now this anomalous, dare I say, like, fourth season, because we have our traditional first season, we have our second season in the Midwest and the Plains for that's very brief and very, you know, unreliable. We have the classic Dixie season during the winter. And now there's this magical fourth season that has appeared during late fall and early, early uh, winter, which I didn't think was physically possible. But here we are. The southeast of elevated tornado counts in the fall, but I was hurt, but. Where I was told at the time, which was in the also the mid two thousands, that was hurricanes. Now there there have always been, especially I don't want to say December. December usually is kind of a dud for tornado outbreaks in the southeast, but uh, late January into early February is usually when the mojo happens. In particular, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, that sort of vicinity. Yeah, you usually have one off. Like yeah, there'll be the there'll be a one-off there. outbreak. Yeah, there'll be a one-off outbreak. You'll get a really solid low, takes a deep dive, and just boom, bunch of tornadoes. And no. they usually and they usually kill a bunch of people. I mean, like those oftentimes throughout history, some of the most damaging and deadly outbreaks were those winter outbreaks in the middle of nowhere in January in Louisiana or wherever. Yep, you can back Super Tuesday, two thousand eight outbreak. That was February. Yep. Yeah, now, no, Super, Super Tuesday is a great example. So, like, um, f fuck, I just lost my train of thought. Fantastic. Just a heads up, we have new hot towers forming on the south side of the circulation. Looks like a nocturnal maximum is going to start picking up now. Oh, what I was saying was, like, I feel like, especially in the last decade... From twenty like twenty ten to twenty twenty, uh, around that time frame, I feel like we've had a really big uptick in like December activity in the it Ohio. Was, 
Ohio Valley and in, in general, December activity was non-existent across the entire country. It was really rare, um, simply because that it tends to be both dry and relatively dominated by Northwest flow. Um, so that like that's neither of those are good setups. But suddenly we're getting December's where we have strong moisture return in December. We had dew points in like the upper 60s, low 70s in Nebraska in December. Oh, which, yeah. Which was just dumb. Like, so what's this huge moisture by? return. What's um, this by? The Gulf is just so fucking warm. Um, with that much moisture content in the Gulf, you're getting much, much better moisture return than you used to. You're also getting much stronger bomb cyclones. Bomb cyclones did not exist before 2017. And then we had two bomb cyclones in like a one-month period in Nebraska does do not exist those are a result of the interaction between that warm moisture return from the southeast and the anomalous anomalously cold and strong polar vortex lows diving out of the north was december 15th a bomb cyclone uh it did not qualify as a bomb cyclone but it was pretty darn close all right do you think second season is going to be active this year uh based on the previous couple last couple of years i would say yes okay so I would, in, I would say in this... what we'll call second season into third season. I would expect we would have a fairly active tornado season all the way into December. Because yeah, I'm so... not sure. Like, like there's all the different things that affect, um, like the traditional season. Like, like you also have tall connections to the, um, and so like I wonder what affects second season there too. Yeah, that's a good question. Um. From from my perspective, when I'm thinking about forecasting on sort of that mid-range meso level range for the rest of the season, I'm thinking more about um, what sort of localized conditions do we have? Do we have moisture? Um, are the ridges setting up in favorable areas? How does the how is the MJO and cycle um, that sort of thing? Um, are there any long-term patterns that are currently set up? You know, where are the blocking ridges? Where are the where are the the cutoff lows at um but you know that's like a that's looking out more like a couple of weeks or maybe a month and not three months mm -hmm. yeah so i wonder now if you know with the gulf of mexico being really warm now like uh, where are we at in terms of anomalies like one like a half a degree or one degree warmer oh uh, yes average? a half to one degree centigrade warmer centigrade okay so, so we're we're almost two two Fahrenheit warmer than the most recent average. Remember that's eighty one to twenty ten, which is quite warm. So what was last year's? Uh, do you know, do you know last year's off the top of your head right on this time of year? Last year's was pretty comparable. Okay, because you know I know you said earlier that we've been getting these December's with you know warmer Gulf Mexico uh, waters and you know it's more moisture. So I, that just makes me wonder for going into this year for, you know, October, November, December, January, February, like, you know, we could get a, you know, a very active, you know, repeat-esque of like 2020, 2021. Yeah, un until you get a couple of gulf clearing um, cold fronts, um, you'll have good moisture return. Um, the gulf clearing cold fronts are what will finally shut that down. Um, and if you don't have any gulf clearing cold fronts, it, the Gulf will just stay open. It'll just keep pumping moisture north. Yeah, because I feel like, you know, like, now it just makes me think, like, it just feels like, you know, it's just been going further north uh, towards the winter season for severe activity. Yeah, um, and that's a lot of that. Well, a lot of that may have to do with something over the last few years with La Nina as well. The, there's not a lot with the way that La Nina goes. The pattern of lows does not tend to clear the Gulf. It tends to scrape kind of down across the, the you know, the plains and then move east. And the, the, those lows often stall out across the Gulf instead of pushing all the way down to Nicaragua. Um, you know, I, I remember stories that my old climatology teacher, Merlin Lawson, used to tell me. Um, he was doing climate research on the coral reefs on the northern coast of uh, Honduras or Nicaragua, somewhere in that area. And they were analyzing coral, and he was there during, uh, he was there during the winter, which is nice there. It's warm, you know, still 80s, tropical, 
But when a really big gulf clearing cold front would come through the gulf, it would go all the way down to the gulf and the gust of cool air from the Arctic would blow all the way down, down through the Gulf into the Caribbean and blow down upon the shores of northern Honduras and into Nicaragua and cool those 80 degree temperatures all the way down into the 60s in a flash. And that is how how intense those clearing cold fronts used to be. That will completely shut off your moisture. It'll dry everything out. It'll shut down all your Gulf return for weeks at a time. And so if you get a Gulf clearing cold front once a week, you're not going to get any moisture return. The problem last fall was we didn't have any cold fronts. There was very little moisture. It was very dry. It was very warm. And all these systems that happened, they all went straight over the Ohio Valley and then just kind of skipped off the East Coast. We didn't have any traditional uh, Colorado cyclones. And then when we do finally get a couple Colorado cyclones, you know what happens? 20, uh, 1210 and 1215. Oh, I am curious if, uh, given these changes, if May is no longer going to be the peak tornado, peak of the tornado count. That number, actually, that month has been, <laughs> it may still be the middle, but it's been flip-flopping a, a lot recently. Um, yeah, tornado counts last year, I mean, December obviously yeah. kind of broke the month, broke the year. Um. June has been making a lot of progress is becoming the new tornado month because a lot of the tornadoes have moved north and east. Um, there was I a like year them. there was a year where Nebraska was the number one tornado state for the first time ever. Uh, Illinois was the first tornado uh, number one tornado state for the first time ever. So yeah, changes are happening. Uh, why exactly has May been not so active recently? That's something I'm wondering. Because May forms in the classic plains areas, and if the classic plains areas don't fire, you don't get no May. Okay. Is, it, is it more of a uh, like a synoptic thing? Like the eight fifties are just too hot, or yep. it's a synoptic <laughs> issue. Pretty but much, because that, guys... that that synoptic issue has greater climate based issues leading to it. We had cooler eight fifties this year. I think we'd have a triple the tornado count or double at oh, least. Yeah. Those 850s were nuclear. Not as bad as last year, but still warm. Um, Gentlemen, I'm going to grab me a drink and hit the head. Uh, all right. Yeah, May and June would have been big year. Would have been big months. We had cold 850s. I don't know. Are we getting less, less troughs in May now than before? I don't know. That's a good question. I, just, I don't think so, but of course I'm not. I'm not as first on climate as Royce. I remember this year we just had we had troughs. We just had poor thermodynamics and nuclear eight fifties. What was that day? May thirtieth. Yeah, that is true. That, May thirtieth would have been a big event if the if we didn't have too many parameters maxed out. That yeah, there was also times like uh yeah May thirtieth actually that was up here. We had too many ingredients. Yeah, if, if I remember correctly, <laughs> Minnesota. Yeah, like God May we had a bunch of really we had a bunch of uh, clearing cyclones in the North Plains and Midwest. They tend to have because I remember because of the fast storm motions we had a lot of we had the winds be strong at all levels still had the shear but something like yeah something would be off where it was too much of a good thing or eight fifties would be too strong or it was too much moisture and I'm never they had never felt so this year where they were predicting tornado outbreaks and it yeah a few but mostly it would it said you had a um, MCS or or squall line or windstorm derecho even. Mm -hmm. A lot of big CVs too. I think May, I think mid April, May there was a big MCV. I gotta look back at my records. But yeah. Oh, that I MCV thought this. Was... Yeah. I think that was eight late April because that was when I chased in Jordan and got that big squall line. 
that was an MCV, and that day was expected to be uh, northwest, southwest Minnesota, there's supposed to be some tornadoes, and it mostly busted. Wait, too, it was too too much moisture, I think. In fact, the fifties were too. How long is it going to be until we get another big plains tornado outbreak? That's what I, I have no think. idea. <laughs> That's a good question. I'd love to see one. I haven't seen one in years. I know. Last That's one actually was, been last one was thing. 2012. There has not been a classic plains outbreak. Like I remember, I thought I thought being in when I was in school, I thought, man, these you know this. The planes are going nuts because 2011, you had the mass, you had all those planes outbreaks, you had the Dipsy mm -hmm. outbreaks. Everything was like all these, you had these frequent EF5s and EF4s. So it's like, wow, this thing, this shit's going nuts. And now you get one there, big tornado or maybe two, that's it. 2013, you had El Reno and more. And then 2014, I think you still had some pretty big ones. But after, 2013 a, had a wedge on. at Illinois in June. A little, a little side note. 2014 had the the, the had the Mother's Day tornado in Nebraska that was a nice wedge. I was there. That's why. But the rest of the the rest of the season sucked up until Pilger. Like everyone was like, the planes are dead. May is over. Oklahoma's dead. Kansas dead. You got to remember, there were no tornadoes in Oklahoma or Kansas that year. Like none. And then everything was in Nebraska. And then Pilger happened. And then the day after Pilger. And then the day after that. And then, like, there was more action in Illinois that year. Like, everything was Northern Plains. Like, everybody in the Southern Plains was losing their shit. So, this isn't the first time that the world ended and everyone thought the tornadoes in, you know, Texas and Oklahoma were gone. But we proved that wrong this last year. And Hill's back, baby. Believe it or not, in my I first heard of this back in my uh, first spotter class, I was like, whoa, but there was a two mile white tornado in South Carolina. It was during the nineteen eighty four um Carolina's tornado outbreak. Which was an anom which was born by an anomalous strong low in the southeast. Oh, I'd love to chase a tornado like Coleridge. <clears throat> that thing was beautiful. beautiful. I, I just all I've seen is half four funnel clouds at this point, but I've only seen yeah, two. I will say, chasing in Nebraska is not usually beautiful. The majority of tornadoes here are rain-wrapped, they're grungy, they're disgusting. Getting More good tornadoes here is an anomaly. The wife and I zero-metered a freaking EF1 earlier this year, and we didn't even know it. Like, I literally drove through a tornado, had no clue, got back, like, home. I was like, well, that sucked. And then uh, the next day, the the survey came in, and we had we were in the tornado path when it went through. Was it Didn't the 29th? It. Was it April 29th? Pretty, uh, the, it was the one in southeastern Nebraska, in, in uh, Odo County, I want to say. So I know uh, April 29th, I think it was southeast Nebraska, there was there's a tornado a tornado producing storm that was just super HP. You yeah, it was it was super HP. It was ridiculous. I could barely hold on to the wheel. I was like, like the car was shaking all over the place. It was just pouring rain. It was horrible. Yeah, yeah, we were in. Oh yeah, that. It, that early. it was not fun. I I have photos Wait. from that day, but like I thought I was driving out of the tornado, but there were two tornadoes. Was the problem? I drove away from one tornado and into the other one. I experienced driving in rain. Frick that again. Not something I want to do with some core punching. I was so nauseous after that. I made myself carsick. I, I swear, I, I was trying to chase the day of the photogenic uh, squall lights, and I got stuck in the squall line. In Nebraska, to... you don't punch the core. The core punches you. I was going to say, I, I, I can't believe how many times I, I, I felt my car slip, and I'm surprised I did not have a hydroplane and flip. In fact, I saw a flip on I-35. Not flip, but the, the car on its... Roof earlier that time, day nine thirty five. Probably it might have. I don't know if a hyperplaner got blown over, but sheesh. Um, I'm trying to find the day of that. Uh, I'm trying to ask that there was a survey on that day. Some it was an August day. Or no, it was July. It was July thirty first. Was there a survey that confirmed a tornado in Wells? I think a Welsh tornado. Uh, let me see the place. Um, it was it was July thirty first. There was a 
Supercell and Wells Odd and Freeborn. That uh one that wasn't tornado worn, but it was sphere worn for Tor possible. Someone said that there was a confirmed tornado in well. I've not seen a survey or any confirmation of that. I don't know where to look for that. Uh, I don't know if the storm predict if uh, AMBX would post that or not. Most of the stations will post uh, a Twitter, and they'll have a temporary link on their website. However, it doesn't stay up for long. I would check the tweets. Uh, most places put them on tweets now. Or you can look it up the SPC website. They'll have it. They, they have everything LSRs. now. LSRs. LSRs are nowhere not... LSRs are not preliminary because... Um, our LSRs are not final because uh, my first tornado ever was at the Wagner, Oklahoma. That was reported as uh, straight line winds and then later confirmed to be a tornado. But if it, I think if you go on L, I think if you go on uh, SPC, it will be still be marked as straight line win. Oh, well, they have reports on there, but then I think they also they should have a second page that it's uh, not preliminary but finalized. However, SPC yeah, totally. might not finalize until end of year. Gotcha. Might have to double check then. I don't know, I have video of that event of uh, May 31st, but no, June, July 31st. Hmm. I'll have to check. In fact, I'll check right now. This... I don't... Look at that thing, I don't think... I don't know if that touched down. If it was a tornado, it was very weak. But I almost ran into that thing. Um... Luckily, I noticed the clouds moving. I guess I noticed the scud being infected into the updraft really fast, and just said, "Well, I'm not going that. I'm not going through that." Did you guys see the uh, MCS that went through Europe? Oh, is that the thing that, uh, like, wrecked Italy? Yep. Very rare MCS started in Spain, was heading south, banked northeast, went all the way across Italy, and all the way up into the Czech Republic. Jesus Christ, yeah, there's a, that was a confirmed rate show, too. 139 mile per hour winds. It's a hell of a rate show. That was, damn, that's crazy. Did uh, July 23rd get classified as a, de a derecho? Which one was that? Uh, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. I'm pretty sure they confirmed that one as a derecho before it was even done. <laughs> 